Hello, my wonderful viewers, and welcome to Simple Foods. Um, it's been a wonderful year so far for me. Uh, I just released the second book, and I am up to date with my reading list. Not very hard when it's only been one month so far, so one for one book. Yeah, I've done that. As a quick reminder, I've got myself a list of about 12 books. Do we have a graphic? We've run out of budget for graphics. Okay, we don't have any graphics. Just remember, picture your eyes. Close your eyes and picture the list. Uh, anyway, um, yeah, uh, it's a list of 12 books I set myself every year, uh, which features classics, brand new stuff, old favorites, and then some from the Times 100 novel list. In January, I reread Neuromancer, which was actually a reread, uh, just to see how did the flavor hold up. But first, I'm talking about this month's book, February. It's called The Price of the Stars by somebody whose name I forget. Uh, the cover is what interested me in this. There was no list, no one suggested it, it just had this great looking pirate woman on the front, spaceship, you know, and the title was so romantic, you know, the price of the stars, what would you pay? All you need to get this wonderful spaceship is figure out who killed your mother. So it should come as no surprise that for February I'm not reading the price of the stars at all. <laughs> no, that's right, um, I found it last year, 2020, read a bit of it to get the flavor and thought, okay, I can, I can try reading this. Uh, then this year when I actually started reading it properly, I realized I'd finished part one and didn't care and it was just doing nothing for me. So uh, I, I put it aside. Uh, I decided that the price of the size was too much and that was it. I don't have time to read books that just aren't doing anything. Uh, to replace, therefore, the price of the stars, I, I looked around and found a fantastic fantasy series by Australian author, what's her name, Cecilia Dart Thornton. Uh, she's written a fantastic fantasy series called The Bitterbind. Uh, I'll put it up on screen because it's it's very interesting how she writes her words. Very fantasy, very takes you in there. Uh, I like that sort of a thing. Uh, the first book is The Ill-Made Mute, which I have luckily a copy of right here. Thank you, honey. Uh, and it's the part of part one of three. Uh, the second book is The Lady of the Sorrows and part three, The Battle of Evernight. Uh, they are very good. They are very, uh, very flowery, but in... The best way possible and I know I said that about Lord of the Rings but that's because of the depth of world that you saw whereas with this I think it's um, it just really grabs you so it's a fantastic story told well really engaging um, as an example that is one chapter I think that is the second chapter and then the third chapter is you know thinner again but this one book is uh, approximately the same size it's 10,000 words smaller than Fellowship of the Rings uh, I don't have a copy of it anywhere to show. No, but anyway, yeah. So that's going to be my February read, and you'll hear more about that in March after I've read it. Anyway, back to the romance. That's what you're here for. Uh, how did it go? Was it worth the reread? Uh, should should I read it? Oh, Lord and Master. Uh, all right. Well, slow down there, pleb. Uh, yes, it was worth the reread. I'm very happy to say, the world of Computers and hacking and outrageous style, uh, it's very lively, it's got a very beat aesthetic for writing that all meld together in Neuromancer uh, in a fantastic exhilarating trip of a book. The highly visual uh, storytelling is a great match to the world in which Neuromancer is set. Uh, ironically for something that is computer based that you have to sort of know a bit about, you don't need to know anything about computers to enjoy it, to get the picture, to see what's happening story wise. In Neuromancer, we have Case. He's our main character, and he's the one who's called the Decker, or the person who's actually using the computer. Uh, he's joined by the tough nut Molly, who's actually the meat, and she'll go in and actually kick ass and do stuff and take people's names. If they need a door to get through, he unlocks it on his computer. If they need someone physically beat down, Molly's your girl. The story is a wonderfully twisted thing with mystery and danger around every corner, uh, and until you end, you don't know how it's going to end. I got way more out of reading Neuromancer this time around than I did 20 years ago. But a lot of that was knowing where the story was already going, and then just being a much more weathered reader uh, than since back in the day. Uh, from about halfway though, I found that I had forgotten uh, what actually happened in the end. I knew some characters that popped up and some that died, but I forgot completely. So to reread the end and sort of relearn it was a real treat. You know, to get the ending again fresh was a, a treat and delight. It's an amazing read that finished well and uh, leaves you with a feeling of just having got off a phone conversation that was really great and you're like, excellent, and you're buzzing and you're like, oh, uh, what, what, what do I do next? I forget. Uh, William Gibson has taken a highly imaginative uh, and tremendous deep dive into the world of computers and hacking 
uh, before we even knew what those things really were or would be about. Um, he simply had an idea and went for it, uh, creating a beautiful piece of literature. And literature, for anyone who doesn't know, isn't just a book, but literally something that you can point at and pick apart uh, quite well for whatever reason, as opposed to just a book somebody wrote like <clears throat> Fifty Shades of Grey. Sorry. It also does feature AI. And this was back in the 80s uh, when, you know, um, that sort of thing was truly rare. I think it was the first book I read where anything sort of came alive and was in the story. These days, everybody walking around is a robot <clears throat> or an AI, and it's not that it's very commonplace. Uh, whereas I like this because not only are the AI rare, they're also powerful and they're very scary. Uh, so it was good to have that aspect once again. Um, it's a bit like Gandalf being the magical race of the Maya in Lord of the Rings. Yes, there's magic, but he's one person who can do it well constantly, can kind of do whatever he wants and is terrifying. Like he's so scared. He's like, don't give me the ring. We'll lose if you do that. It'll corrupt me. And then it's just game over. Same sort of thing. So what would I give Neuromancer out of say 10? Uh, I don't normally like using rating systems or it's just a number because it's arbitrary. This 7 out of 10 might be worth more than that 7 out of 10. But, you know, I've, I've got a system. Don't worry. It works. It works. Neuromancer can have an 8. Uh, what have I written here? It's far from perfect and is in a niche genre, but it's really worth your time and effort to locate, read, and get into it. Uh, it hasn't had the impact of, say, Lord of the Rings. I don't know much else has. And it hasn't had the influence of Pride and Prejudice. So when it feels about right to me. Uh, I'll talk more about my rating system in a later video, but trust me, there's some kind of logic there. In essence, 7 is good and readable, above that is really good, nothing is a 10 out of 10, and if it's 6 or less, eh, there's a few points missing. Uh, yeah, so thanks for joining me for another week. That was Neuromancer. Fantastic, go out and get it, absolutely still worth it. Um, next I will be moving on to the Ill-Made Mute. You can see I've already made a little bit of progress there. Uh, but join me next week when I will be answering some of your questions. I've had some on Facebook and um, YouTube videos, so thanks. Keep them coming in. Uh, and I will also be looking at Stormbringer Elric by Michael Moorcock. Uh, it's sword and sorcery. It's like the opposite speed of Lord of the Rings in terms of fantasy. Lord of the Rings is everything and it's very slow. Sword and sorcery is fast, powerful, punchy. Usually the sorcerer is the bad guy and the good guy has some real cool magic, but it costs a lot to use. Very fun, very fun stuff. And my second book is now actually published, uh, A Machine of Blood, also known as The Full Life of a Robot 2. Uh, it's up on Amazon and available for purchase. Uh, I'm super happy with how it turned out, uh, the insane amount of work I managed to put into it, um, and even I was surprised by the path it actually took. You know, when you write a story, you've got, you've got plan A, and then you've got your characters, and your characters go, no, 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 here's storyline C and D, and then F, and then Z somewhere. Uh, so it was a lot of fun to uh, read and write and make the whole thing. Uh, links to book one and two are down the bottom, of course. Uh, and thanks to everybody who's bought a copy so far. What do you think? Send me a word. Uh, shout at me about it. Whatever. And please don't forget to like and share this post and to click the little red bell so that you get notified any time that I post up a new video. I've managed to do one a week so far. Uh, it's pretty easy. After the first couple of hiccups, we're still getting some. We always will. Um, but I'm actually quite enjoying having fun like this. I genuinely appreciate all the feedback that I'm getting. Uh, it inspires me to keep reading and to keep writing, as I'm hoping I'm inspiring you to keep reading, uh, writing. If you want to do that, go for it. It's not for everybody, but if it's for you, it's lots of fun. Uh, half the fun of my writing is that I don't know what's coming out. So it's like I'm writing an episode and getting to watch it at the same time. Yeah. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you for all that. It all helps. Uh, so now, <clears throat> time for my cheeky outro. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'm Moriarty. What are you reading? <laughs>